Hello, my name is Mark DiCarlo. Today my guest is Tamara Cochran May, attorney in San Patricio County. Nice enough to come on the show uh, two weeks in a row. <laughs> no, not two weeks in a row, but thank you very much for coming in. You know, I'm having a hard time getting guests now. I don't know if everybody is just real busy or they're afraid to come on or um, they just want their weekends because we filmed the show on Saturday. I don't really know what's going on, but I, I've been having a hard time getting guests. You were a assistant county attorney in San Patricio County for many years, right? Correct. For a total of 12 years. And now you're running for the county attorney's office in San Patricio County against David, David Aiken. Aiken, who's been a county attorney how many years? 34 years. And why are you running for county attorney? Because is, is it an easy job? It pays more money? Uh, you have some sort of uh, idyllic uh, ideas towards what you want to do in the job? What's the reason? Well, initially it started because David got very ill. And um, he had heart problems and was waiting on a heart transplant. And we didn't know whether he was going to make it or not. So uh, both myself and the other assistant actually ran in the Republican primary. And I had such a, a good support system after that. <coughs> um, I realized that there are things that I can do in the county attorney's office, things I can improve on, things that can be changed. And, and one of the the things that I'm, I'm really interested in uh, is um, this, the problems that synthetic marijuana cause in our county and how prevalent it is. Um, I would like to be able to, to publicize that. In addition to making the county attorney's office more transparent, also publicly addressing these problems as synthetic marijuana, domestic violence, um, juvenile crime, those, those issues that need to be addressed and I believe that I can improve um, <coughs> communications with the law enforcement agencies in our county. All right, synthetic marijuana. Synthetic marijuana is some sort of a green substance that they, sp that they spray some sort of chemical on, right? Yes, what they do is it's like potpourri or weeds or dried weeds or something that will look like sort of like marijuana. They spread it out on a on a slab or a floor and they take a regular weed sprayer like you would use with Roundup and they put the chemicals in there and it may be one of the cannabinoid synthetic cannabinoids that have been developed or it could be Drano or it could be Clorox. It could be, you know, acetone, a number of things. People don't know what is in it. And, the, and whoever's making it goes out there and sprays it around, just like you're spraying weeds, and then let it dry, and then package it. Well, where do you... Okay, because I do criminal defense. You used to be able to buy it in stores, in convenience stores, here locally, and then you're able to buy it in Houston. Yes. Up until maybe three years ago, two or three years ago, you could buy it in stores, right? Yes. So can you still buy it in San Patricio County and or whatever, Nueces County, the surrounding areas of Claiborne County, or is it no longer available for sale commercially at convenience stores? It's not supposed to be for sale commercially in convenience stores because the legislature has made it illegal to sell or possess it. And what is, isn't that... Kush. What is Kush? Is that what Kush okay. is? Kush, spice, uh, K2, ecstasy. Uh, there's various names for the synthetic marijuana. And a lot of people use it because um, most employers don't Can't test for it. Don't test for that. They don't with their drug tests are for everything else but synthetic marijuana. Well, I you know, the whole issue of drugs I find very interesting um, and the legalization. I think you said to me one time in your office, we're just talking, that you said, well, I think they should, le I believe you said, I think they should legalize marijuana to prevent people from taking synthetic marijuana. Did you say that? Did you think that's a, 
Is that an intelligent assessment? Yes, and my, and my position is that uh, synthetic marijuana is a good argument for legalizing uh, organic marijuana because organic marijuana doesn't kill you and synthetic marijuana does. So how many, so you know, of, you know personally of deaths from synthetic marijuana in your county, yes. in San Patricio County? At least two or three in the last six months. I see. Is synthetic marijuana real cheap? Is that one of the reasons they're taking yes, it? Yes, it's also much cheaper. And I believe that there may be <clears throat> even some people making it in locally or in Houston. It may not be necessarily imported. Because I, I, I listened to the defendants and, and being a, a prosecutor of misdemeanors, um, a defendant can waive the right to have an attorney and visit personally with the state about their offense. And I, in talking to the defendants, they've told me that some people have made the synthetic, you know, locally. You order the packaging off the internet and they package it themselves. But you still, again, you don't know what they're putting in there. Some people, you know, you can, you can Google synthetic marijuana and you will see what synthetic marijuana does to you. Uh, it attacks your kidneys, it attacks your brain, it can put you in a coma, you have seizures, blackouts, and it's something that, that even after you quit smoking it, it's still, it's still doing these things to you. Interesting. So if I'm a first-time offender, I have synth I'm 18 years of age, and I get caught with synthetic marijuana in San Patricio County, and I believe you work for the uh, county attorney's office until maybe a, a month or so ago, what would I expect? Uh, will I get probation ordinarily if I'm 18 and I don't have any prior record for uh, possession of synthetic marijuana? Yes. Yes, you would. You would get also maybe get a pretrial diversion, which is um, uh, almost the next best thing to a dismissal. Pretrial diversion is basically an agreement with the uh, uh, the prosecutor but you in our county you still go before the judge you're on probation for a certain period of time you pay a, an administrative fee but at the end of that probation your case is dismissed and you can have your case expunged so you pay five hundred dollars up front in your county right, right? That's, that's the same the, as in Nueces County right. you pay this five hundred dollars up front and then uh, you go on probation. It's usually six months, I guess, in San Pat. I know it's a year. It's a year. Okay. I think it, some of the misdemeanors in uh, Nueces County are six months. Right. I, the DWI for pretrial diversion is a year. And at the end of that, the case is basically dismissed, and you could expunge your arrest record, right? Correct. So that's a pretty good deal. So how many of these young people uh, on synthetic marijuana that get pretrial diversion ever finish it, do you think? Many of them? All of them? Not Certainly not all of them because... I hate to say this, but synthetic marijuana is very addictive. And it is very hard for young people to break that habit. And a, an example of that that I can tell you about was we had a young man from Portland, and he started out on pretrial diversion last, not this past spring, but a year ago, 2015. Um, he got arrested again, or he tested positive, so he was put on deferred adjudication probation. Um, his probation was revoked. Well, at, right after he got placed on probation, within a month he picked up two more possessions of synthetic marijuana. And this young man was driving a vehicle, would black out, and just be parked in the middle of the roadway or drive up on a curb. With those two additional um, uh, offenses, then we revoke, you know, he was revoked, we filed a motion to revoke probation. And when he came to court, I recommended to continue on him on probation, to dis but to send him to the ISF program which is a facility, uh, inpatient facility, lockdown facility in, in Sinton. And after he, you know, he thought about it, he refused to do that. So 
he was given 90 days sentence on each offense. The minute he comes out, he starts doing it again. And that accident on 181 several months ago where a young man hit a, a highway worker and killed him, this was this young man because he can't get away from synthetic marijuana. And then he's out on bond and he's still smoking synthetic marijuana. He's picked up for PI, be, being based on the synthetic marijuana. So what other, so synthetic marijuana is a real problem. And I guess you also, uh, do you treat possession of marijuana any differently? Were you treating them any differently in uh, San Patricio County than synthetic marijuana? No. The, the only thing that we might do is emphasize more um, the inpatient rehab because this synthetic marijuana is so addictive. It, you know, it's not nearly addictive. Regular marijuana is not nearly as addictive as, regular, as, as synthetic. What's your position that a lot of people believe that uh, marijuana is not addictive? Do you think it's addictive? I think to a certain extent it is. Yeah. I think it is. And I, well, in my personal experience through the years, you know, you know, and the, the, I went to University of Texas. I saw, you know, people who were lived in the dorm smoking marijuana every single day, and and finding that that it was addictive to them for whatever reason. Right. Well, and then I've known people. Okay, I don't know now, but I, I mean, I'd follow people for years and years, and there were people that smoked marijuana for years and years from the time they were in college to the mm -hmm. time they were adults, you know. Yeah, and they get stopped in San Pat County, and I see them. Teachers, oh, is that right? Teachers, lawyers, you know, different people from other you counties. Mean? Oh, you, you, you say, you're you not meaning you literally see them smoking marijuana no, in cars. No, no, no. You see but them in court? They're seeing them in court for possession of marijuana. Give us some names of some high-profile attorneys. <laughs> How about uh, judges? No. I'm just teasing. No. Um, well, the other thing that's amazing about – I'm going to talk to you about this, and I mentioned it before. Do it at home. All the criminal defense lawyers, we'd all be out of business if these people would just get drunk at home or do synthetic marijuana at home or smoke marijuana at home. We'd all be out of business. Mm -hmm. we, me and other defense lawyers would laugh in the hallways and that before. What is it, man? Do it at home. And I've told people before. So is it because it's real addictive? Is it just a style of living? You can't be in a car without smoking? Is it, is it the experience? What's going on with that? I think it's the experience that mm -hmm. they get from it. But what's so scary is that um, they, they start having convulsions and seizures. They black out. They become violent. Um, it, you know, there's, if you Google synthetic marijuana, you'll see the stories there where one young man, 19 years old, took one hit of synthetic and it killed him. He was in a coma and... You know, another one that uh, a young girl, same thing, vegetable, brain dead, because of smoking synthetic marijuana. I had one defendant talk to me and he said, you know, I know this is real bad. He said, but it's, you know, it's hard to get away from it. But nobody taught us this in school. Nobody taught, what, you know. What, you, what do you mean taught? What were they well, teaching in school? I don't understand. Taught how bad synthetic marijuana is. They didn't even bring it up in school. Well, and, but, and, mm -hmm. and the other drugs, you know, they you know, say no to drugs. You know, there's a big campaign in the schools about drugs and how they affect you. But because the synthetic marijuana is relatively new, it, it has, um, the schools aren't educating on it. You know, the... Well, that's interesting. So, yeah. he, so he's basically saying it would have helped if he would have received yes. education on it because it's new. Yeah, I don't know if I, I don't know if I personally agree with that. I mean, you're going to see kids that wouldn't even think of touching any of that stuff, and they don't have to be educated about it, right? Right, right. But you know, the idea is not smoking in, you know, not smoking any drugs or do, using any drugs. But I've also had some kids come in and and tell me. I said, you realize this is going to kill you. That's I always tell them that. And they said yes. And and I remember one in particular has told me my dad made me sit down and watch all Googled on YouTube 
all the videos about synthetic marijuana, and now I know how bad it is for you. Well, you know, that, that's interesting. Of course, one of the issues is, is we're chasing these drugs around, whether it's synthetic marijuana, whether it's ecstasy, whether it's crystal meth, and then they say, well, we gotta, we gotta get tougher on these, you know, these drugs, and then if we get tougher, we'll solve the problem, or if we do this, we're gonna solve the problem. I mean, I don't see any solution of the drug problems through the criminal justice system myself. And, and there's probably not, but you at know, least you would want I mean, you got to, I'm not saying. Kids to be, to make an right. informed choice about, you know, okay, I'm going to smoke synthetic. Well, do you know what synthetic does to you? Oh, it gets high. Well, that's all they know. They don't know all these other things it does to you. You know, damages your brain, damages your kidneys, damages your lungs. Yeah, I almost hate to discuss the uh, subject because it's been going on for so many years since obviously I was uh, 18 and there's all these different theories and nothing seems to um, uh, work. Um, it is interesting synthetic marijuana is still considered a misdemeanor mm -hmm. um, even though it is it, it sounds as if it's almost like a what you almost would consider a hard drug. Yes. And, and, but it's still considered a misdemeanor. You also mentioned about uh, domestic violence. There was a series of uh, newspaper articles in the Corpus Christi Colored Times about uh, domestic violence and I could be abrasive sometimes because, you know, I, you know, they're basically Libby Avert, the editor, or pu I don't know if she bills herself as editor or publisher. She's been over there so many years. She's saying that telling law enforcement, do something. She's telling the DA's office, do something. She doesn't say what they're supposed to do. And my, my personal opinion is, and you, you know, calling uh, the DA's office out or whatever on a domestic violence case is, I don't see how uh, how they're gonna. It, it's it's the same with the drug problems. Have they been able to solve the drug problems? Are they going to be able to? Are you going to be able to solve these domestic uh, violence problems? We recently had a case that got some degree of publicity about a hooks baseball player that struck his girlfriend in the face three times. Did you read that? I heard about it. I had and and hit her with her glasses. I don't know who would even do that. You'd have to be how you could even imagine doing that. And then, as is typical, I believe you would, you would agree, she goes into court and says, no, he's got to come home. I don't want a temporary restraining order against him. He's never hit me before. So this is what the cops and the DA's office and whatever the county attorney's office face every day. These people have these, you know, there's a spousal abuse, and then they always want to get back together. Or sometimes, you know, when the cops go, you know how that'll go, the woman might jump on the back of the cop for arresting him or for, or for trying to arrest her husband. Ridiculous things like this. And they're trying to say that we can, whatever, county attorneys or district attorney's office and, or police officers could solve the problems. You have, you're, so, but in count, the county attorney's office, do you have, do you handle domestic violence cases or are those mostly district attorneys? No, with the Class A's, family violence, go into the county attorney's office and they are difficult to prosecute when the woman wants to file a non-prosecution affidavit. And how, what is the percentage of the time the woman wants to file the non-prosecution affidavit? I'm sure it's 60 percent. At least. At least 60 to 80 percent. But what I, I tell them I, I, and I tell them this, and a lot of times they're coming to file a non-prosecution affidavit and the defendant has brought them. They're sitting outside in the hallway. I know. And the they're, defendant, the, the man, the man who's the charged. Man who's charged, right. They're afraid of them. And they come in and I don't just dismiss, or I didn't dismiss because they had a non-prosecution affidavit. I would talk to the victim and I would tell them. I would tell her, you know, just because you're filing the non-prosecution affidavit does not mean I'm going to dismiss the case. It is out of your hands now. And I would, t I would talk to her more and talk to her about has this happened before? What is going on in y'all's life? Is it, you know, a lot of times when people are going through a divorce, they do things that they would never have thought about doing and they, they may get violent with each other. Uh, having financial problems or what have you. So I discuss it with them. And if it's a first time happening, a lot of times I'll send the offender to anger management 
and then maybe I'll consider dismissing the case with the non-prosecution affidavit. But before I make that consideration, I look at his criminal history, I look at the, at the, the circumstances surrounding the offense, and I speak with um, the victim. And there has been um, times when they have been, uh, there was a case not too long ago where uh, a man was trying to hit his, his, um, his dad and the mom got in between and, the, and hit the mom and left a big grapefruit on her forehead. And she wanted to dismiss it because she said her, it, she, it, it was a mistake. He wasn't trying to hit her. And I'm well, he's trying to hit somebody. And even though she wanted to dismiss the case, I, I would not dismiss it because he, he committed an act of violence with her. And if he hadn't hit her, he was going to hit his dad. And he needed to understand that that is not acceptable behavior. And he needed to go um, on probation for counseling and what have you. Well... You know, I wonder, is, do you think that the problem, I think we're roughly the same age, do you think the problem was worse years ago or it's just being, or, I mean, not as bad years ago or it's just being reported more or it's, it's a, an attempt by the state and the government to prevent abuses from occurring? Or do you have an idea? I think years ago women were afraid to come forward. They were afraid to report the crime. They were afraid to be out on their own and they would lose their form of support. And when Farrah Fawcett was in the movie The Burning Bed, I think that brought up to light battered woman syndrome and domestic violence. It became more out in the public. It's not a secret anymore. You know, people would keep, the women would keep secrets. You know, they have bruises or, or black eye. Oh, I ran into the door jam. Well, then, it, then she was abused, allegedly. Farrah Fawcett, mm -hmm. did you read that? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Um, anger management is interesting because a lot of the, my clients, you, at least they used to say that anger management worked pretty well, the guys, that they learned a lot from it. I don't know if they're, if it's, I guess it would depend upon who teaches it, et right. cetera, but I guess it's not a bad program. Uh, and there's also a better intervention program that's longer than anger management. But one thing I, I know happens mm -hmm. is that family violence will, will accelerate. The, the 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 injuries it es it ex escalates and and right. a lot of times right. and right. and it escalate and um, if you don't just because a woman says I don't want to prosecute for whatever reason um, I tell them I said you go out there and tell them you signed a non prosecution affidavit it's up to me I'm not I, whether I dismiss it or not. You know, you tried. I want them to tell them you, that they tried so that the husband, boyfriend, whoever, won't get mad at them and beat them up again. Because that will happen. You know, um, I know this wouldn't be popular to say, but I'm going to say it. And I mentioned it when I was talking to one of those uh, journalists at the Caller Times via the Internet. I think a lot of the women have emotional problems. It's, it's, it's kind of like homelessness, like how are you going to solve that, the drug problems. I think a lot of them have emotional problems. Who in their right mind, somebody's beating you up, and you're going to go back to that house? I mean, I mean, they need the treat. I think they need the treatment more than the men. They do. They need this treatment to be strong and raise their self-esteem because what has happened to them is that the, the abuser has hounded them so much that they, you know, they're not worth anything. Nobody else is going to want you. You're not going to be able to live out there. I'm going to throw you out on the street. And they keep going back to them for the support. And I've, you know, I've talked to many victims and I've asked them those questions and I've talked to them about what's going on. Before I 
I was an assistant county attorney in, in San Patricia County. I was also an assistant district attorney in Jim Wells and Brooks County. And um, I don't, I, I guess I maybe do remember you over there. And but 1992 to 96, okay. that's about when it was. And um, I was prosecuting a case where the stepfather was peeking through a hole in the bathroom at two young girls. And mom was standing by the stepfather because she didn't, she didn't have any way to, you know, no work or whatever. He was supporting her and was telling the little girls they were lying. And those little girls were so mad, <coughs> they were so angry. But then it happens that the stepdad takes them out in the country, each one of them on separate occasions, and tries to rape them. Mm -hmm. And they get away from him. But they were so angry at mom, believing stepdad that he wasn't doing anything. But her whole position, the mom's position was, you know, what will I do if I don't have this man here? Nobody else is gonna want me, I have two girls. And that type of, that's more of an emotional abuse that begins and then escalates to the physical abuse. Yep. And that's why they don't get away from them. That's why they don't leave. Yes, we think, we're, we're going like, what is going on? Why don't these people, why don't these women get up and leave? But they don't because they don't know any well, other life. Well, maybe they're lazy, they don't wanna work. It could be that they, it could be that they are lonely, that they're afraid of being lonely without someone, or they don't have the skills to work, and to support their kids. Well, we have all these. We have um, you could get these government programs. Um, a lot of uh, programs you can't get unless you do have a child and you're not mm -hmm. receiving an income. Section eight housing, right? These right. conservatives are always complaining about these programs and um, food stamps. Um, so, you deal in the Class A domestic violence. You were dealing with them for some years in San Patricio County. And under Mr. Aiken, I assume David Aiken, the uh, county attorney, did he give you free reign? Were you, were you watched regarding plea bargains? How would you run the office differently than what Mr. A Aiken is presently running at your Democratic opponent? Well, the... Um I did not have discretion on every kind of case, especially not DWIs on dismissing or give granting pretrial diversion. Um, I'd, and a lot of times, any t there was a dismissal of a case, I would run it by him and tell him the reasons and he would say yes or no or go try it or what have you. Um, one thing that I would probably do differently is I would become more involved in the in the in the runnings of the office, not as micromanaging, but as being aware of what every attorney does and know how to do it, and also knowing the jobs of the secretaries, what they're doing, and the investigator, and what have you. And and as it was when I left, I'd have done all the attorneys' jobs at one time or another whether it was CPS, uh, juveniles, um, advising uh, commissioner's court, JP cases. Uh, most of my time spent was prosecuting adult misdemeanors. But as a county attorney, you need to be aware of everything that is done in that office and know how to do it and be able to step in uh, and do it without any problem. Right. How many uh, assistant county attorneys uh, presently work in uh, for the San Patricio County Attorney's Office? Well, when I was there, there was three. So now there's two. And I'm sure, I think he's advertising for the third position. Okay. And it seems like whenever I go to court over there on the misdemeanors, you're always handling all the misdemeanors. Yes. So that's the way it seems. How, how often do you, uh, are you trying a case over there in San Patricio County? Once, once a month, once every couple of weeks, or what? We had uh, trial dates maybe twice a month, but we also had an announcement date, and that was 
pretty effective in settling a lot of the cases. So maybe toward the last couple of years, it was um, maybe once every two or three months that I would be trying a case. Okay. And when I started in the beginning, I'd be trying two cases a month. So. Well, when I um, I know this in Oasis County. I don't know if this is. I think it's true. I wouldn't tell my clients as I say. Well, look, in some of these small towns, they don't have the manpower to try too many cases. I said, but in Oasis County, they'll go try a bad DWI case, mm -hmm. or you know, they have the manpower. And um, in some of the smaller towns, I haven't had you know that. Sometimes it, you know the manpower isn't there to try a, a, a DWI. Uh, some of these bad DWI cases. You all, do you do the juvenile cases as well? Um, no, no, I wasn't doing juvenile, but I have done them before when there wasn't uh, an assistant in that position, I would do them. Okay, so juvenile cases have traditionally been handled by the uh, county attorney's office. Yes. I think in Nueces County, there's actually a different kind of a court. There's a juvenile court. Right. But you don't have a separate juvenile court. No, in the San county Patricia, court at law handles in San it. Patricia county. And again, this is Tamara Cochran, Cochran May uh, running for um, a county attorney in uh, San Patricio County. The county attorneys handle them. I, I tell my clients a lot of times that um, one difference between the juvenile system and the adult system is the juvenile system, it used to be maybe it's changed some now. It was set up to help the kids. Right. Where the adult system, not, so, not as much, not nearly as much. Um, is, that, is that a correct assessment? Yes, yes. And... Um, I don't know. They used to call it TYC, Texas Youth Commission. Is that what they still call it? No, or they changed the name. They've changed the name to it, and it's completely. Oh, you forgot right now. Yeah, <laughs> left okay. my mind. So, just how... like just like CPS has, has changed to the mm -hmm. uh, family and Ch and family protective services now. TFPS. Oh, at, how about uh, TDC? It was it was TDC for years? Texas Department of Corrections. That's Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Mm -hmm. And I make jokes. I say, you know why they changed it? Under when it was TDC, Texas Department of Corrections, I used to say, hey, to the juries, I say, hey, you're trying to correct this guy. You're trying to correct mm -hmm. him. So now they, they change the criminal justice. And then Mark Skirk used to always argue, we don't want, uh, we want justice for the victim. And I used to always argue, of course, we want rehabilitation. So they changed, they, I, I, obviously, I don't know why they changed it. I think they just like changing the name of these government agencies to confuse us or something. I don't mm -hmm. know. So how many kids go to TYC, Texas Youth Commission? And a lot of times it's until they're 21, right? Yes, or 18. Yeah. Okay, 18 or 20. But isn't it sometimes 26 too? Is that correct? That is if you are, if you have determinate sentencing. And that would be where a grand jury uh, would return an indictment or approve a determinate sentencing application. And you would go to... Uh, for purposes, we'll say TYC, until you're a certain age, and then have a hearing to see if you're transferred to uh, the criminal so that, justice system. So, impliedly, you're saying that's like carved out exception for more serious crimes. Yes, as such, and as you know, certifying them as an adult. And have you been through the certifications? We're in. They went. We're in the. Uh, you want to certify him, him or her as an adult. And then once they're certified as an adult, based upon certain standards, then it's kicked upstairs to district court, and he's tried as a felon, right? He That's right. It has to go to grand jury, just like an adult case. And once he's indicted, then it just goes through the regular process. So you have you had those since you've been uh, working at the county attorney's office? Um, we've had one there. And I've had, it's not something that's real common in our county, and I've also done the certification process in uh, Jim Wells County and Brooks County because in the DA's office over there, I prosecuted not only the adult felonies, but I also prosecuted um, the CPS cases and the, the juveniles. So let's see, Jim Wells, of course, is, is Alice, and Brooks is, I forgot. Falfurious. Brooks is Falfurious. There's quite a difference between, like, say, Jim Wells, at least, and uh, in your area, San Patricia County, wouldn't you say? Yes. Kind of a big demographic yes. difference, poverty difference, et cetera, right? Yes. So how long were you in Jim Wells? About Brooks? 
five years, I believe it was. And that was felonies? Yes. Give us an interesting case you did over there. Give us a... I'm just... I have a real interesting one, and this, this was... Uh, it was weighing on me because one of the secretaries in her office brother was a witness or involved in the case. And this, um, her brother and this other woman were, they weren't seeing each other, but they were driving around and she, she had an ex boyfriend. And they, come on, they weren't seen together. Well, but, they but no, around. they weren't seeing each other as a couple, but they were friends and they were out messing, you know, in Alice, there's not a lot of things to do but well, drive around out well, the country, true. you know. So they were driving out one of these, uh, county roads and they stopped so she could go to the bathroom and she was driving and a car passed him a truck passed him and went down the road turned off his lights and as she was coming back to get in the car he came charging at her and hit her and killed her hit her you know the brush guard threw her several feet and then he left so it was a hit and run and did he do it on purpose? Well, that's what couldn't be determined. Right. You know, that, that just couldn't be determined on that. It almost sound, sounds like yes. it, because what are the odds, right? Yes, yes. And um, his truck was found, the defendant's truck was found in a brushy area south of town, covered up with the tarp by some people who were out in the area. It was like local <coughs> community. And... Um, the DPS officers did a fabulous job, but they had, they picked up each of, and this was before PowerPoint. So I was using slides. I mean, I never overhead, used PowerPoint in my life. Uh, it was an overhead projector yeah, and, yeah. you know, and PowerPoint. slides and, and what have you. And they were showing all the pieces of the, of the vehicles that were left on the side of the road and where the woman was found and, and, uh, and what have you, and um, um, the woman from the DPS lab came in, the forensic scientist, and and put them all together in a puzzle in front of a jury. And the one witness that could tie the defendant to be the driver of the vehicle was basically a drunk, and he admitted to be an alcoholic. And he and the defendant had been at a bar uh, south of Alice playing pool and drinking. And I needed his testimony to come back in and, and, and talk about the, that he, you know, he remembers, he was asleep, he remembers waking up because he hit something or ran over something. And, you know, he, could, he was the only one that could testify for sure that it was his friend driving that vehicle. And they left. And, um, and the same uh, defendant called his friend the next day and said, you know, don't talk about it. I moved the truck, what have you. So everybody was saying, well, this guy's a drunk. You know, he, you know, he, gets, he drinks a lot of beer. He crawls. He gets so drunk he passes out on the sidewalk and what have you. And he's telling me all this stuff. He goes, I really don't remember <coughs> this, you know. And I had already gone through you know, interviewing him before trial. And I said, yeah, but you do remember him coming to your house and picking you up. And he goes, yeah. And you do remember going to play pool, you know, at the bar. Yeah. And I, you do remember waking up when he hit something. He goes, yeah. And then I said, and you do remember him calling you the next day. And he's yeah. So of course the defense attorney is giving him a hard time about, um, he uh, remembers this, but he doesn't remember that. Yeah, that's yes. what I'd be saying. Yes, and that's exactly what he was so saying. Well, funny. he got he says these things, but and the witness goes on the stand. He goes, "I do remember getting in the car with him, and I do remember going to the bar with him, and I do remember waking up and and after he hit something." So he was very good saying those those things because he did remember all that stuff. He was trying to shove it off as as being a drunk because that's what everybody told him he was, but he remembered all that. And it was a very interesting case because there was so much evidence to put before the jury, like physical evidence of the, 
of the crime scene and what have you. Well, it's nice you say interesting. It's difficult to do all that. You yes, gotta, it you, is. You got to introduce all that stuff into evidence. Yes. You know, and, and you got to know all those evidence rules. You got to stand up to objections. That's difficult to do. Yes, it is. It was a very difficult case, and my investigator was gone for the time during trial that I usually depended on to help me with the right. evidence. But um, he had helped me before he left to get ready, and that um, that was one of the the most interesting because I had I used slides, I used the overhead projector, I used pictures, and I think one thing that in that influenced the jury or helped the jury make a decision was that the forensic scientist I had her put the uh, table in right in front of the jury box. And we were able to identify the things that the DPS trooper took off the, the road. He picked up off the road. And the items that she took from the vehicle after it was impounded and put all those pieces together like a puzzle. So they had no doubt it was that vehicle. So you got a conviction? Yes. How much time? 20 years. Intoxication manslaughter. Mm. That was the maximum. Oh, was it? Mm-hmm. 20 years, what are, they, what are they going to serve on a 20-year five? I don't know. He, I don't know. and Because it's, it's not aggravated. It's interesting. I don't know what they would serve. Right. It's interesting. So on you also, on the juvenile cases, what is the most common kind of juvenile case that you see over there in, uh, again, this is Tamara Cochran May. She's running for uh, St. Patricia County attorney. And on the juvenile cases, what are the most common crimes? I'm going to guess... Possession of marijuana. Is it? Mm-hmm. Where, where, where do kids get marijuana from? Buy it from other kids? Yes. Somebody goes to the school and sells it. Somebody else has it. Uh, some of the kids, and another, <coughs> another crime we see a lot of is assault on a family member. That they're, you know, they won't, they may have some emotional problems. They may be bipolar or what have you, and, and um, they, the anger problems and they so the juvenile gets mad at the person with emotional problems and strikes out no the juvenile has the has, emotional, problems has emotional problems and strikes out at the parent or another sibling so then what are you going to do what are you going to do punishment's not going to do any good really if he's the kid's crazy well we make sure that he gets evaluation by mhmr or he gets evaluated by another psychiatrist that he gets any medications he might he might need. Um, that's one of the things. I just recently um, became aware of a uh, organization in Aransas Pass called Second Chance Boxing Club. It's a nonprofit private corporation that brings in troubled kids, and the person there um, teaches them to box, takes them to competition. And I think that's a great outlet for kids. For the kids, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, think, I, think, uh, I think it could be. So those are the two com most common is the assault and then the possession of, um, possession of marijuana, which they're buying from somebody, selling to somebody. Mm -hmm. I don't know how all that works. And, of course, theft. And they steal, the kids steal iPhones from Shop each other. Or shoplifting, shoplifting too. Shoplifting, But, yeah. you know, stealing stuff at school. It's, it's just the same. The kids, you know, well, do the, think, they're doing stupid things, you know, they're like that. Well, I think back when I was a kid, and all the guys that I knew pretty much well did goofy stuff. Mm -hmm. They didn't, we didn't get caught at, you know? Right. So I don't know if those kids are getting, doing a lot of, they're just unlucky, but we all did kind of goofy, the men anyway, mm -hmm. you know. That did goofy stuff or some sort of goofy vandalism. I don't know. Why guys do that? You know, I, I assume you you prosecute a certain amount of vandalism oh, cases, yes. right? Yes. Hit mailboxes or whatever goofy. I don't know. I don't know. I think the young guys get a get some sort of a pleasure out of that. But you know, sometimes, and I'm kind of laughing about it, even though maybe I shouldn't be. But you know, I guess you don't want to you don't want to go overboard with the prosecution of those cases right. because. You know, I think a lot of them will get back on the right track. How about um, in in Nueces County, they used to prosecute, um, what do they call it, truancy. 
Yes. But I, I don't think I don't think it's through the county attorney's office. Yeah, it is in our. Is it? In yes, because the laws changed for the truancy, and JP is actually um, prosecuting the truancy cases. But one of the assistant county attorneys goes over oh, there okay. to prosecute it. So, so like, what? How do you prosecute a truancy case? You just figure the, the young man or young woman isn't in school, and they don't have an excuse. So that's like, like a. Is that a, a is that a crime? It's a class C, yes. Is it? Mm -hmm. I man, I miss so much school. I've had so many class C's. I don't think they <laughs> used to prosecute it. Well, um, the, you know the 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 truancy officer from the schools brings the report over, mm -hmm. and there is somebody from the school present in prosecuting and showing the unexcused absences, how long they were gone. Um, so what do you do to the kid? Put them it, on probation. It's usually community service, maybe a fine. Oh, okay. Um, but it, it, normally it's community service in the class C's. Oh, okay. So the kids got to go out in the heat and pick up trash or hand mm -hmm. out. And attend school. Oh, and attend schools. So that's like the worst um, torture of them all. <laughs> no, I, that's like being, that was like being in prison. Um, I'm editorializing again. Oh, I like school. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I just, um, I just couldn't, you know, stand it. I, I, by the time I, I went, well, I have a bachelor's, a master's, and a law degree. Oh, yeah. What's your master's in? Public affairs from the LBJ School of Public Affairs at were you, UT. Were you ever, ever able to market the degree? No, because after I got it, I was living in Alice. Right. And well, you can't market a degree like that in no, Alice, not Texas. In Alice. Right. It's public administration and policy development. Mm -hmm. But And then not too soon after that, I went to law school. Now, you would have been a perfect candidate for the city manager position in Corpus Christi, Texas. But, you know. I like the practice of law. Oh, do well, you? Well, anyway, what I was getting to was that my mother asked me by the time I get to law school, she goes, are you going to be a career student? And I said, I would if well, I could. She used wisdom. You know, yeah. you know that there are people that become institutionalized and they never want to leave school. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's a problem. And um, some of the community colleges have a problem with that, though they don't want to, you know, uh, some of them, I think, make money off of it. So you like school. Well, that's... Um, I didn't like the stress of the grades, but I like I enjoyed school. And I enjoyed the LBJ school because um, Barbara Jordan was one of my professors. Oh, is that right? Yes. And she, she was very good? Yes. Oh, she, that's she, interesting. She taught a, a, a class on political ethics and values. Well, that's interesting. Um, I, I, did she pass away now? I think yes, so. Yes, she has. Well, um, so what other kind of class, what are other interesting class A uh, cases that you handled over there in, um, say, in Patricia County in prosecuting? I'm trying to think of what, what other Cruelty kind of cases. Cruelty to animals. Oh, is that right? Yes. In the rural areas, it's a fairly common problem with dogs and cruelty to animals, isn't it? Yes. But not e some of these are not even in the, you know, like out in the country or anything like that. These are people that, that just don't take care of their animals, mm -hmm. you know, that are going to let them become just totally covered in ticks and fleas. Mm -hmm. um, so much that the dog needs a dog, I mean, a blood transfusion. And it's not like they're low economic people. It's, right. it's somebody that, that just... You know, my and, and I have two dogs. I'm I'm an, I'm a dog lover, and a pet. You know, animal lover. But if you're going to have a pet, you need to know what the responsibility is of taking care of that pet. And um, you know, I know in Portland there's been a problem with people dumping animals. I have one of the animals that evidently I, was dumped. I have a. I know I have a cat that. You felt sorry for it, brought it in the house, mm -hmm. you know, and then you wind up feeding cats because you feel sorry for them and all that. And I don't, I've never really had an animal as an adult other than the ones I felt sorry for, you know, whatever. Well, this, this one, uh, I have a white boxer um, that started living under my house. I have an old wood frame house on Pier and mm -hmm. Beams. And then she started pawing at the back door wanting to come in. <laughs> but she was spayed. She had mm -hmm. a chip. She was heartworm negative. Um, she was crate trained, house trained, 
And I think whoever got her just didn't realize how expensive it is to take care of a big dog. You know, 60 pound dog, by the time you do, you know, flea preventive, mm-hmm, heartworm preventive, mm-hmm. um, annual shots, and I also give mine a rattlesnake vaccine, you know, that's, that takes money. That's interesting. So you never were able to find out who the owner was? They can't nope. locate the owner through the chip? They can only the locate the dog? The chip was not registered. You have to register your chip so people can find you and your, you know, match you mm-hmm. with your dog. But the chip wasn't registered. Oh, I see. So the animal cruelty cases are fairly common. The DWI cases are fairly common. You mentioned CPS earlier, Child Protective Services. They, they're usually... Again, I don't know if they changed the name of that agency. Texas Family Protective Services. Texas Family Protective Services, which I guess maybe then it's incorporated all family members. Maybe that's why they changed the name. Right. And those are cases, though probably most commonly, where the child's being abused in some uh, way. Yes. So I guess those cases are hard. Uh, a true case of abuse is pretty hard to take, I guess, seeing those. Oh, yes. Um, and But... Even though you're with a county attorney's office, I thought those are prosecuted as felonies, no? The abuse is prosecuted as felonies, but the termination of parental rights goes through our office, the so, CPS. And the termination of parental rights is a civil lawsuit that's filed by, I guess it's called, no longer that government agency, where in they say, look, you've been you've beaten your child up so badly for so many years or so many incidents have occurred that we're going to take your child away from you and put it in a um, whatever foster well, it's home, not et cetera. Just, it's not just beating up your child. It's Trying abu- to simplify it. It's Talk abuse. Talk street language. Neglect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, using drugs in front of your kids, putting them in danger. Right. Um, driving around with them while you're using drugs. Right. And, um, uh, you know, medical neglect emotional abuse there's a laundry list in the family code but that I, you always but claim the, but the termination you have to be the termination of parent child relationship it has to be pretty extreme in other words there's at first maybe you put the parents on probation and watch them or something or survey the household and then after that and then if they don't right well cps uh, will after if they're actually taken from the family cps uh we there's a hearing on a on the temporary orders and cps will prepare a family uh, service plan which includes um a counseling if right, right. drug That's treatment right. parenting classes whatever <clears throat> and if they don't do that then they move on to termination and what i've seen the problems with that is that most of these parents, if they if they can't afford to hire an attorney, they do not get an attorney appointed to them at the early stages of the case. They don't get an attorney appointed to them until down the road when they're actually going to a termination hearing. I think that's one of the big mistakes in the system. I believe that that these parents may do better with somebody telling them this is what you need to do other than cps <coughs> right <laughs> because they know cps is not necessarily on their side right. so if they have an advocate yes explaining a system to them talking to them saying well i'm acting in your interest <clears throat> that would be preferable yes <clears throat> i see but i don't you wouldn't probably have anything to do with that that's up to the judge that's right? correct that's correct well, I think we're pretty close to the end. It's been Tamara Cochran May. I think we have maybe five minutes left. Were there any important issues you wanted to talk about, about running the San Patricio County Attorney's Office or well, and when, being a county attorney? When I had mentioned before about uh, the county attorney knowing all the jobs in the office, I think it's also important that all the assistants know all the jobs. So that when one goes on vacation, one is sick, one is out for whatever reason, that the others can take over so that there's a smooth uh, flow of the work going through. Who does, so you get a budget, I guess, to run this office? Yes. Do you know how much the budget is offhand? 
No, and I help prepare it. <laughs> no, I can't think of it right I mean, now. I, I mean, I, I usually don't ever advocate for higher wages for people, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I do know in, in, I think in Nueces County, our assistant district attorneys are not adequately paid. Are underpaid. Paid. They are not adequately paid. And I just didn't know. And as a matter of fact, we lose a lot that go to Kingsville, Alice, et cetera, where they make a lot more money. Well, the average, I want to say 75000 for a assistant county attorney, assistant district attorney, maybe be a little less on special programs. In, in San Pat. In San Pat. I don't think that's too bad. No, over here in Nueces County, it may be 40000 Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Nueces County is ridiculous. As high as we're taxed, you think we, you know, right. these young people, and you know, all the young kids, they, 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 they all have $100,000 to $150,000 in debt now for student loans. Right. And um, so, yes, yeah, so I don't think that's too bad. And then I guess you get certain fringe benefits, medical <clears throat> care, et cetera. Medical, retirement, dental, um, Get our bar dues paid, CLE. <laughs> Continuing yeah. legal education for free. Yes. Well, not free, but I mean. How many years retirement is it to retire as a county attorney? How many years do you have to have in? It's like the state. You're, I think, at least 15, but your, your age and your retirement have to equal 80. So if you do win, poor Mr. Aikens out on the streets, he'd get retirement, I guess. Yes. I'm just teasing. No, he said he'll get retirement. He's had it. He'll get retirement for 34 years. And what happens is that the county, our county, San Patricia County, for every dollar that you that a, an employee puts into the retirement system, San Patricia County pays two dollars and puts two dollars in it for you. So if you could discipline yourself to save that money, you'll be in in good oh, shape. You know, I mean, you don't have any choice. That they take it from your paycheck for the oh, retirement. Okay. Oh, I yeah. see. Yeah. All right, this has been uh, Tamara Cochran May. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, Mark. You, thank you for showing up twice. And if Mr. Aiken wants to come on in time, he's welcome to do that. I did call. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night.